Today we're going to talk about the Fourier transform and continuous spectra. So uh, you're probably wondering what do I mean by continuous spectra. So let's, uh, let's get some context here. So the context is going to be the heat equation on the real line. So before, of course, we would uh, have the heat equation like so, but we now we're going to, rather than having it on a finite length bar, we're actually going to take x to be on the, uh, oops, it's going to be on the entire real line, and t, of course, is going to be greater than or equal to zero. Uh, and of course, like before, we usually have an initial condition so we, we set u at x, uh, t equals 0 is equal to some function, f of x. Now this function, again, is on the entire real line, so we can write that as sort of like this. Uh, x going to infinity that way, and going to negative infinity that way. There's a 0. And we have some function, f of x, that lives on that entire real line. And then, of course, we want to know if this is the temperature profile, initial temperature profile of this, of, this, uh, of, this, of this conducting media of heat. We want to know how the temperature flows around on this real line. And so, again, there are no constraints. There are no boundaries. So there are no boundary conditions. All right, so uh, let's see how that affects the problem. Um, all right, so before, as before, right, for any, uh, any of these sort of solutions, we always would do the following, right? We would, we would do a separation of variables. So we take u of x comma t and make that p of x times q of t. And then we'd s substitute that into the PDE. We would get p times q prime is equal to k q times p double prime and we would separate out and get p double prime over p is equal to q single prime over k q is equal to what we call negative lambda that and this of course was always unknown all right so um so we require a few things right first of all for this thing to Although we don't have any boundary conditions, we still have some uh, some some constraints. There are some constraints. So we require that that uh, that u of x comma t be be bounded, right? We 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 don't want any solutions diverging to infinity. Uh, on the x-axis or um, or on the time in the time domain, so that that'll be our one requirement, and that's just a really basic common sense requirement. All right, so with that, let's try solving uh, this equation. So we usually solve the p equation first, and that helps us constrain. And so you typically, right, when we solve this equation, this is what helps us constrain lambda, right? So if we always find solutions of the form p of x is equal to uh, cosine, so a cosine root lambda x plus b sine root lambda x. All right, so there is another possibility, of course, that we have exponential solutions, right? If, if uh, lambda were negative here, then we would get uh, solutions of the form e to the uh, root plus or minus root lambda x. But we can uh, we can uh, uh, we can rule those out because we don't want any diverging to infinity. So we know it still has to be trigonometric functions. But uh, there are, there are no boundary conditions. So you, typically, the boundary condition is what would that would con so a, a BC would W O U L D. Uh, constrain uh, the root lambda, but since there are no boundary conditions, lambda is a free parameter.
And that's what I mean by a continuous spectra. So we can actually define omega to be root lambda. So remember before when we would have when we had boundary conditions, uh, you know, we would we would get something like the following. We get root lambda was equal to something like n pi over l for some finite bar. Um, and those represented those spatial frequencies. So let's write this on another page just to make it a little clearer. So uh, with uh, BCs, you'd get something, you know, you'd get something like the following. We get square root of lambda was equal to n pi over L. And these were the allowable Uh, spatial frequencies. So if we were to write this real line as follows, we'd have 0 to L right there. And, and n pi over L would, it, would enforce that our solutions look like this. Right, because this would be a sine um, pi over L X, right? And then we it would go back this way to negative L, uh, negative 2 L, and so on and so forth, on forever to infinity, right? And then you could also get solutions like this. And that, of course, is uh, sine 2 pi L X, and so on and so forth for n equals 3, 4, You'd get higher and higher spatial frequencies, right? But the point was that at every point, at every point, at every multiple of L, we would have it crossing the zero line. Okay, those were the allowable frequencies. So the boundary condition, u of zero is equal to zero is equal to u of L, uh, that gave us, uh, it constrained, it would uh, constrain. allowable allowable uh, root lambda values uh, but without without boundary conditions of course uh, what we're going to call the spatial frequency which is root lambda which we're going to call now omega uh, is free so we're going to say it's now just a real number it could be any uh, any frequencies allowable, so we can have uh, frequencies like this, uh, you know, any frequency at all. So what we ha have now is that p of x is equal to um, is equal to uh, cosine a cosine omega x plus b sine omega x. Those are all allowable. So we can think of that as the solution set for the ODE, for, this, for the separation of variables. And we can actually say now that solution set is a continuous spectra because the set that that runs over is, again, a conti the continuous real line. It's not discrete points on the line, but the entire real line, the entire real line of possible frequencies. So uh, and in fact, we can write this in a more compact notation. Uh, by, by noting that we can come up with a complex form, the complex exponential, and call p of x now. We can actually make that subscripted by omega is equal to e to the i omega. And I'll put a negative sign on there just for, for a notational simplicity, which we'll see later. And that's just the complex exponential form uh, of the above representation, which we can... Uh, um, we just have to take the real or imaginary parts if we want uh, the two above solutions. All right, so uh, again, that's with omega varying across the entire real line. So that's a very compact way of writing the solution space. So, so now let's go to the, the Q equation. So the Q equation, so again, we had P omega of X is equal to E to the negative I omega X. That's our solution space. So omega is free to vary. So how does that constrain Q? So our Q equation was 
sorry, it's going to be Q down there, and that's equal to negative lambda. And now lambda is going to, so if, if omega is equal to root lambda, that would mean then that omega squared is equal to lambda. So it should be a positive value. Um, um, so uh, we, can, uh, now, we can now do this. So uh, we can um, now um, write Q prime is equal to K, negative K, uh, omega squared, Q. And that has solutions of, the, of exponential form. So that becomes Q of T is equal to uh, something we've seen many times before, negative um, K omega squared T. Uh, and now this again is, a, is subscripted by this continuous spectra. So the solution space now, ome uh, we put it together. which is u of x comma t is equal to now uh, p omega x times q omega t which is going to be equal to e to the i the negative i omega x e to the negative k omega squared t alright so before when this was indexed by end we had you know, and indexing by n. And so we were able to now come up with some sum of solutions. So like before we would have something like this, u of x comma t then was the sum of um, solutions of the form uh, we would have a n sine uh, n pi over L x uh, times e to the negative k uh, n pi over L quantity squared t and that's n equals 1 to infinity and that was a, a, an acceptable solution now uh, and then those were the Fourier coefficients But now, what we have now is, is a, uh, we don't have a, a, a discrete sum, but now we have a continuous sum. So now, I, what I call the ANs now is going to be indexed by, I'm going to call it A, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it A omega. I'm gonna just going to re, redo my notation. I'm going to call it F omega. And these are my Fourier coefficients, just like before. But now it's going to be continuous. spectra. So our, our, our discrete sum becomes u of x comma t is equal to uh, what's going to be now a sum. It's going to be a, an infinite integral now in both directions for both uh, negative and positive. f omega and now we have our basis functions there. Instead of having uh, these 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 trigonometric ones. We're going to have this 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 thing here. Now it's defined. Uh, it's again a trigonometric identity, but but uh, it's going to be defined uh, for a continuous omega. It's going to be e to the negative i omega x e to the negative k omega squared t d omega. We're going to average over all possible spectra all possible omega values. Every possible frequency could play a role in this. So that's the idea here. All right, so you're trying to wonder, okay, how did, how did this get to there? And how, how do we then, uh, you, know, you know, what is F omega? That's a good question. How do we find it? We know that before, when we find Fourier coefficients, we had to use inner products. Um, and, and uh, find an orthogonal projection. But what do we do now in the case of continuous spectra? Is there something we can do there that's similar? And it turns out, yes, there is something similar. And now we're going to do some, a little bit of definitions here. So what we're going to do is define the Fourier transform. 
I'm going to call it f omega. And it's going to be equal to 1 over 2 pi, the integral from negative infinity to infinity uh, of f of x um, e to the i omega x dx. All right, and then I, and also I'm going to define the inverse. So this is a lot like this is like a Laplace transform. Okay, so the inverse transform is going to be f of x is equal to uh, integral from negative infinity to infinity of capital F omega e to the negative i omega um, omega x uh, d omega. Okay, so uh, and so this is, I'm going to put a little asterisk here. This is if f of x is continuous at x and it's going to be equal to the average of the left and right limits of f if um, f of x is uh, not continuous. Okay, um, so what's going on here? Why are, we, why are we defining these this way? So these again are we're just going to take as definitions. We're going to see how it connects back to what we just did with the heat equation. Okay, so we can see that there's obvious similarities going on here. All right, so um, let's put this together and try to figure out how to, how to make that click. Um, so first of all, um, what we're saying then here is that um, I'm going to write down another definition. So just like a Laplace transform, we want to talk about how we can transform one into the other. So if we have some function of f of x, and I want to take it and I want to transform it, and I'm going to, call, I'm going to label my Laplace transform by this squiggly f, and that outputs that function capital F omega. Just like we would, we would, uh, we would think of a Laplace transform when we learned those in 2250. All right, and of course, then we also have uh, the uh, the inverse uh, inverse Fourier transform. that goes back. Okay, uh, With the one caveat that if f has a discontinuity in it, um, the, 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 uh, the, uh, oops, sorry, the, um, the, uh, the, if, if f has a discontinuity in it, then the Fourier, the inverse Fourier transform uh, will take the average of the, of the left and right endpoints. But that's a, a minor uh, consideration here. So otherwise, everything will be, will be pretty much the same. All right, so, um, so here we go. That's our, that's, our, that's our picture of what we're doing here, why we're defining these transforms this way. And of course, as you would understand, Fourier transforms have a lot of nice properties that help us solve um, PDEs and also ordinary differential equations as well um, by, uh, by exploiting some really nice properties of Fourier transforms. So we can see already that, um, that, that, that the Fourier transform will come in handy. So let's talk about now again, um, you know, why, why the Fourier transform? So why the Fourier transform? So let's, uh, let's go back and consider what we also had before. So we have this case where um, u of x comma t was equal to, was equal to this um, integral from negative infinity to infinity. So this is our solution to the heat equation. was going to be f of omega e 
um, e to the negative i omega omega x uh, d omega, right? That was our average. And then we had this e to the negative k omega squared t hanging out front. All right. So this was our uh, linear combination. A linear combo of all the basis function. U, well, I'll call u omega x of t, which were um, e to the negative i omega x, e to the negative k omega squared t, right? And so, so this right here was the um, was the weight function. And so that is a, effectively the, the Fourier coefficients. That's the, effectively the Fourier coefficients when you uh, take this integral to essentially be the, the weighted sum uh, of, of many, uh, uh, just like we would do for a Fourier series. Okay, so now we're not dealing with Fourier series, we're doing Fourier series continuously on a continuous spectra. So let's try to, to bridge the gap here. So what we're going to do then, I'm going to get out another sheet of paper. Um, Let's go back to our equation before. So we started with, uh, so now consider um, uh, the PDE problem uh, ut is equal to kuxx on a finite length piece of the real line, L, negative L to L. And we'll take as an initial condition to be f of x, which is defined on the whole real line on, but only restricted to negative L to L. And we know from bef uh, we also know that we can write down then um, the solution to this equation is going to be of the form uh, u of x comma t is equal to the sum. Um, of n equals zero to infinity of um, a n cosine n pi over l x plus b n sine n pi over l x uh, all multiplied by e to the negative um, k n pi over l quantity squared t all right, so that works. Uh, where and but what I'm going to do now is we want to bridge the gap between our complex representation and this uh, what I call the real value trigonometric expression. So re recall that e to the i um, n pi over l x is actually cosine n pi over l x plus i times sine um, n pi over l x. All right. Likewise, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to re-represent our, our Fourier series a little bit. Um, we have a, a we want to have a complex exponential here um, representation of our Fourier series. So um, and. Recall also that we want to we, we want to determine these uh, a and b values with the initial condition. And that's going to have to equal f of x. And this is on only on negative L to L, okay? Uh, one way to, and so of course we can write down the ANs and BNs as orthogonal projections, but it turns out we can also, if I take, um, with this uh, representation here, we can easily write down that, um, that, uh, um, that 
uh, we can write down um, a n plus i b n is actually equal to the integral from negative l to l of f of x times e to the i n pi over l x dx, but we just have to remember to put that 1 over 2 l down there, this negative l there. Okay, uh, just to keep the all everything working out, I'm going to define those as cn's. Now these are in the complex plane, uh, but we can always pick out the an's and bn's from this. So in, in fact this gives us a nice compact representation of how to find both the an's and bn's by doing a complex integral. Um, and it turns out we can write as our Fourier series then, f of x, then equals, um, just like we've done before, uh, it equals, we can write it down, and it turns out it's, we start at negative infinity and go to positive infinity, and we can write this down as cn e to the i n pi over l x. Okay. So that's just a nice complex, uh, compact uh, representation of our Fourier series. Uh, and now we're just going to take it over uh, uh, both the, all, all of the integers, not just the positive integers. Um, so, so there we go. So that's just a compact representation. of our Fourier series, okay? And that's just, it uses complex, uh, complex exponentials to do the same job as sines and cosines, uh, but it all works out in the end. So, um, so we can use that. Um, now, uh, as you might recall then, what we can do is, we can, s so I'm gonna get a new sheet of paper out here. So before we had f of x, equals the sum of n equals negative infinity to infinity. So we're integrating, we're, we're adding up over the, all of the integers now. And we have these cn's, and that's going to be e to the i n pi over l x. All right, so that's our initial condition represented with a Fourier series. Um, so the next thing we want to do then is now let our n pi over l be what we call our omega n's. Okay, so I'm going to write that over there. And recall again that uh, the cn now is going to be integral from negative l to l of f of x e to the negative i omega n um, uh, um, sorry, apologies there going to be positive i omega n x dx. Okay, that looks good. Uh, and so then what we're going to write down here is how we're summing over these things. If these are the omega n's, then that'll be n equals zero. It's just the zero point, And that will be um, n pi. It'll be uh, pi over over L, and that will be uh, 2 pi over L, and so on and so forth. But now, as we take, now we, what we want to do is expand our uh, range. So we're going to take L going to infinity, but we're going to do that as a limit, so really just make it, make it big. So start with L, and then go to L plus 1, L plus 2, and so on and so forth on to infinity. So what we're doing there is now, if that's n pi over L, and then we make it L plus 1, or maybe, maybe what we can do is actually say, not L plus 1, we'll go 2L, and then 3L, and then 4L, and so on and so forth. And what that does is each time we do that, we can think of this as... as um, or maybe what we'll do is we'll go 2L, 4L, and then maybe go 8L. So every time we're going to double our, the, the, the length of our interval. And what that does on the omega axis here, this is omega n's, is it halves everything. So now that becomes that point, and this becomes this point. 
and so on and so forth. So that's for 2L, and this is 4L, and so on and so forth. So we can see basically it's a shrinking grid. Okay, so that looks nice. Um, so uh, what we have here then is um, we can put this all together. So what is this grid width? So if I want to measure what is that width, I'm going to call that delta W. Delta W is going to be equal to the difference between n plus 1 pi over L minus n pi over L, which turns out to be pi over L after you do the arithmetic. Okay, so pi over L, that means that... Um, it doesn't depend on the n value itself, it's, but it just depends on L. So as L gets smaller, delta W gets smaller as well. Oh, sorry, as L gets bigger, delta W gets smaller, or delta omega gets smaller. Uh, so what we can actually write down then is, um, uh, um, so sorry, we need to uh, put a 1 over 2 L there. I forgot about that. So let's write this Fourier series down then, this, these Fourier coefficients. So f of x is equal to the sum from n equals negative infinity to positive infinity. And now these cn's are going to be uh, 1 over 2l, integral from negative l to l, f of x, e to the i omega n x dx. So that's my, uh, that's my cn there. Okay, and then I'm going to times it by e to the i n omega n x. All right, so remember that this is a, we can actually put dummy variables in there. I'll call those cases now. And that just makes the, 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 the thing work out. So I'm going to keep with my calculation f of x equals. So now I see that pi over l here, sitting here. And so what I can write down is that becomes the sum for n equals negative infinity to infinity. And that be so that there, there's that pi over l. So I can rewrite this now as the integral negative l to l of f of c. We'll use our dummy integration variables, i um, times omega n c d c. I'll put a parenthesis around that, and that becomes e to the i omega n x. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a uh, uh, identify that this is now going to be um, uh, we had that we have to put that two l there, and that two l is going to become one over two pi times delta omega. All right, so this starts to look a little like a Riemann sum. All right, so as L goes to infinity and omega n becomes a finer and finer partition, it's going to become closer and closer to the real axis. That will also become just omega, an element of the reals, right? Because we can take any limiting sequence, uh, any partition we want uh, as we take this limit down. And that's going to transform this sum into a uh, infinite integral. So that's going to become negative infinity uh, to infinity, the integral. And this uh, part right there times the 1 over 2 pi is going to sit in there, 1 over 2 pi. And the L's are going to go to infinity. That becomes negative infinity to infinity. F of C e to the i omega C d C. Uh, times e to the i omega x d omega, which is, of course, the result of this is going to be pretty straightforward. We can see it. This is going to be the inverse 
Fourier transform uh, of the Fourier transform of f is equal to f. So there's our result. So now we see how uh, we can, I'm going to write down now just a, just a, a, a brief summary of what we're doing. So um, we can write the Fourier transform of f is equal to capital F omega, which is equal to 1 over 2 pi negative infinity to infinity of f of C e to the i omega uh, C d C, and the inverse Fourier transform of capital F is equal to f of x, a very similar transform going back like so. Okay? And this gives us a nice way to represent solutions to things like the heat equation, where once we have this, then uh, we can write down the following. So uh, our solution to the heat equation is now just simply going to be the integral from negative infinity to infinity of f omega. Those are our Fourier coefficients gotten from the Fourier series times uh, e to the uh, 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 i omega negative i omega x times e to the I, negative i oops not negative i negative k omega squared t d omega okay so uh, this doesn't get exactly yet give us a constructive formula for solving these equations but it does give us a nice start. Uh, uh, um, this is the solution to the heat equation and uh, we see now that uh, uh, we can um, use Fourier transforms to do this so in a later video we'll explain how to more constructively use the Fourier transform uh, to solve uh, PDEs like the heat equation uh, the wave equation and uh, um, other equations like that Thank you very much.